வணக்கம் லுக்கிங் அட் தி அமௌண்ட் ஆஃப் மூவ்மெண்ட்ஸ் தட் ஆர் பாசிபிள் அட் த தம்ப் காப்ப மெட்டகாப்பல் ஜாயிண்ட் ஆர் த ட்ரிபிசியோ மெட்டகாப்பல் ஜாயிண்ட் அஸ் இட் இஸ் நோன் இட் இஸ் சர்ப்ரைசிங் ஹவு டிஸ்லொகேஷன் அக்கர்ஸ் ஓன்லி சம்டைம்ஸ் த கிரெடிட் டு ஆல் திஸ் ஸ்டெபிலிட்டி ஃபார் த காப்ப மெட்டகாப்பல் ஜாயிண்ட் ரெஸ்ட்ஸ் மெயின்லி ஆன் த லிகமெண்டஸ் சப்போர்ட் so before studying about the carpometacarpal joint dislocation in the thumb we need to understand the ligaments that are supporting this joint and allowing so much of movements yes and also apart from the anatomy we shall be learning about the mechanism of injuries that cause carpometacarpal joint dislocation in the thumb and the management options <laughs> study of thumb carpometacarpal joint dislocation will entail study of the anatomy the mechanism of injury the clinical features and the management when considering the anatomy of the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb there are three important points that we need to learn the bones that make up the joint the movements that are possible and the ligaments that support the joint the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb or the trapezium metacarpal joint is an articulation between the trapezium and the base of the first metacarpal the trapezium is so important for the movements of the thumb that it articulates with three other bones the scaphoid the trapezoid and the second metacarpal this joint is a synovial saddle joint and it is multiaxial let us try to understand what the saddle joint is the saddle is the structure that is placed on the back of the horse on which the rider sits the unique feature of the saddle is that it is concave in the longitudinal axis and convex in the transverse axis this allows the rider of the horse a lot of mobility while he is riding the horse so when we compare the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb to a saddle joint we need to understand which is the saddle and which is the rider and what are the movements that are possible the trapezium is the saddle like structure it is concave in one direction convex in another direction the first metacarpal bone is the rider that sits on the saddle of the trapezium the concave surface is seen in the sagittal plane and it allows adduction abduction the trapezium has a convex surface in the frontal plane and it allows flexion and extension movements the entire surface of the trapezium presents a spherical surface that allows circumduction movements of the thumb though the thumb has been provided with so much of mobility it is also important to provide stability so that it doesn't go off track often this stability is provided by the ligaments mainly apart from providing stability to the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb the ligaments also control the extent and direction of joint motion they help to maintain the alignment of the joint and they help to dissipate forces generated by the activated muscles that are working on the joint there are 16 total ligaments that stabilize the trapeziometacarpal joint but of these four are the most important the anterior oblique ligament the posterior oblique ligament the intermetacarpal ligament and the dorso radial ligament the anterior oblique ligament originates from the volar tubercle of the trapezium and attaches to the volar beak of the first metacarpal base it consists of two parts the superficial part or the capsular layer and the deep part which is partly intracapsular the superficial anterior oblique ligament does not stabilize the joint in flexion and it does not prevent dorsal subluxation it only provides laxity of the trapezio metacarpal joint to allow pronation and forms a voluminous pouch to accommodate the moving metacarpal base the deep part otherwise known as the beak ligament is deeper and thicker it forms a pivot 
for the trapeziometacarpal joint for pronation of the thumb. The posterior oblique ligament is like a fan from the dorsal lip of the first metacarpal to the dorsal aspect of the trapezium. This ligament becomes taut at the end of supination and it does not become elongated in carpometacarpal joint arthritis. The intermetacarpal ligament runs obliquely from the dorsoradial aspect of the second metacarpal to the volar ulnar tubercle of the thumb metacarpal base. The primary function of this ligament is to restrict radial translation of the first metacarpal bone. The dorsoradial ligament originates on the radial side of the dorsal trapezial tubercle and inserts on the radial dorsal side of the first metacarpal base. It is reinforced by the abductor pollicis longus tendon. This ligament acts as a stabilizer or a check rein to radial subluxation. It becomes taut with radial or dorsoradial subluxation before the other ligaments. If all other ligaments but this one are cut, the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb still remains reduced. The mechanism by which the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb dislocates is when axial compression force is applied on a flexed thumb, driving the metacarpal base out dorsally. This is the more common method by which the dislocation occurs. Sometimes a dorsal force applied in the first web space, that is the thumb web space, for instance from the handlebar driven into a motorcyclist thumb on impact can also cause dislocation of the carpometacarpal joint, though it is less common. When such a dislocation occurs, the dorsoradial ligament is torn. The anterior oblique ligament is partially stripped or peeled off from the first metacarpal base, but usually it remains continuous, at least partly. Dislocations of the trapeziometacarpal joint can occur from closed injuries or open injuries. A clinical diagnosis can be made from the history and the symptoms of pain over the thinner eminence, a deformity formed by the dislocated thumb metacarpal base and loss of function of the thumb. The usual x-rays like the PA view and the lateral view and sometimes the Roberts view help in confirming the carpometacarpal joint dislocation on the thumb. Another x-ray known as the stress radiograph may delineate the dislocation or subluxation better. This is a PA view in which both thumbs are positioned parallel to the radiograph plate. The distal phalanges of the thumbs are pressed towards each other along their radial borders. This levers the metacarpal bases laterally and if there is any capsular tear or laxity, radial shift of the metacarpal on the trapezium will occur. And this view will also help because the involved thumb carpometacarpal joint can be compared with the normal side simultaneously. The classical findings on X-ray are dorsoradial shift of the metacarpal base and sometimes joint space widening. MRI is also indicated particularly in situations of persistent or recurrent instability after reduction and MRI also serves as a guide to ligamentous reconstruction. What happens if these dislocations are left untreated? They lead to mechanical instability of the joint which interferes with normal function of the hand obviously and can lead to articular degeneration also. The goals of management of carpometacarpal joint thumb dislocation are first to reduce the dislocation, ensure thumb carpometacarpal joint stability and ultimately regain thumb and hand function. Before studying the management of such dislocations, we need to first see the factors that need to be considered and finally we shall see the management protocols. There are four important types of factors to be considered. D O C S the direction of displacement, open versus closed dislocation, complex versus simple dislocation and the stability post reduction. The direction of dislocation may be dorsal, lateral 
or volar but dorsal dislocations are the commonest and there are two subtypes the hyperextension subtype where the volar base of the metacarpal catches on the dorsal edge of the trapezium in an extended position the bayonet subtype where the metacarpal base is displaced on top of the distal trapezium in a position parallel to its longitudinal axis in considering whether the dislocation is open or closed majority of thumb carpometacarpal joint dislocations are closed dislocations open dislocations can be seen especially in blast injuries but they are rare such open dislocations need urgent irrigation debridement open reduction pinning and ligament repair we also need to consider whether the dislocation is complex or simple commonly carpometacarpal joint dislocations of the thumb are simple dislocations and reduction can be done under wrist block complex or irreducible thumb carpometacarpal joint dislocations are indications for open surgical management and finally stability after reduction a stable thumb carpometacarpal joint dislocation can be reduced and then put through an active range of motion test under local anesthetic block without redislocating the management of thumb carpometacarpal joint dislocations can be non operative or operative the indication for non operative management is if the carpometacarpal joint is stable on reduction this implies that the anterior oblique ligament is intact after closed reduction immobilization must be done in a position where the thumb is placed in abduction and pronation we need to remember here at this point that the thumb should be positioned to prevent its tip from opposing the digits which would create axial compression along the thumb ray this implies that the cast that is going to be applied must include the interphalangeal joint of the thumb also like this and not leave it free like shown in this particular example this immobilization must be maintained for 4 to 6 weeks sometimes patients presenting with acute post traumatic pain in the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb may not have gross clinical instability or radiographic evidence of subluxation or dislocation here we need to make a diagnosis of a partial volar ligament tear and proceed with management using immobilization for 4 to 6 weeks as has already been described the indications for operative management of cmc joint dislocations of the thumb are when closed reduction is not possible or closed reduction has been possible but the joint is not stable after reduction and in chronic cases when we plan operative management the options available are closed reduction and temporary pinning and reconstruction of the ligament and pinning with this technique better abduction and pinch strength can be achieved rather than open reduction and just pinning so when considering closed reduction and temporary pinning the only indication is that when primary reduction is not possible but secondary reduction in the operating room resulted in a stable joint suggesting that interposed soft tissue was extricated by manipulation in such a situation we need to provide extra support to this joint with two percutaneous 0.045 inch k wires one k wire passed down the medullary canal and one wire passed obliquely across the base of the metacarpal to provide rotational control when the oblique pin is driven across the joint the metacarpal should be held in abduction and extension as the joint is held manually reduced pressure at its dorsal radial base seats the metacarpal and approximates the metacarpal beak to the volar ligament to encourage ligament healing but if the metacarpal does not reduce congruously or remains dorsally or laterally translated or if the joint continues to feel grossly unstable it must be assumed that soft tissue is interposed 
or that a small undetected bony or chondral fragment is preventing reduction. Open indication is indicated and ligament reconstruction must be done. The technique of volar ligament reconstruction was described by Eaton and Littler in 1973. The incision that is made for this type of reconstruction can be a straight radio palmar incision which has the advantage of preventing injury to the longitudinally lying branches of the superficial radial nerve. But exposure by this incision is limited. Better exposure is afforded by the Wagner incision, but care must be taken to avoid injuring the branches of the superficial branch of the radial nerve. After making the skin incision, the thenar muscles are elevated extra periosteally. The CMC joint is then inspected through a transverse arthrotomy. Now, a dorsal to volar hole is made in the metacarpal base perpendicular to the plane of the thumbnail. The hole should exit just distal to the volar beak at the insertion point of the volar oblique ligament. We then need to place a 28 gauge stainless steel wire through the hole for later passage of the tendon graft. We then harvest a distally based slip of the flexor carpiradialis tendon starting ulnarly so that as it spirals it ends radially. For diagrammatic purposes I have shown the split part of the flexor carpiradialis tendon in green color to differentiate it from the native FCR tendon which is shown in orange color. After attaching the volar end of the 28 gauge wire to the proximal end of the FCR tendon slip, the tendon is pulled through the hole from volar side to the dorsal side. At this junction, we need to place the thumb in abduction and extension as has already been described. The graft is sutured to the periosteum adjacent to the dorsal hole with 3-0 braided polyester suture. Now the free end of the tendon slip is passed beneath the abductor pollicis longus to which it is sutured again. The tendon slip is now looped around the intact flexor carpi radialis tendon and then back through the dorsal aspect of the tendon and finally sutured at the base of the metacarpal. After this is done, we need to reattach thenar musculature before closing the skin wound. After the procedure, the thumb must be placed in a thumb spica cast for 4 weeks, continuing with night splints for 2 more weeks. Range of motion exercises can be started after removal of the cast at 4 weeks. We need to advise to avoid strenuous pinch and torsional movements of the thumb for 3 months. Now let us see a summary of management of thumb carpometacarpal joint dislocation. Dislocations can be acute or chronic. The management of chronic dislocation is surgical. Acute dislocations may be reducible or not reducible. If they are reducible, we need to check whether they are stable or unstable after reduction. If they are not reducible, surgical management is indicated. If the joint is stable after reduction, a POP cast application for 4 weeks is advised. If the joint is unstable after reduction, surgical management is again indicated. In patients with a little instability after reduction, a K-wire fixation along with the POP cast for 4 weeks is ideal. Whereas, if the patient is involved in manual work or is a sports person, a dorsal capsulography and ligament reconstruction along with the POP cast for 4 weeks should be done. I hope you liked the video. I enjoyed making it. Please do click on the show links to see more about dislocations of the interphalangeal joints and also about fractures of the metacarpal bones. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery, plastic surgery and trauma surgery. Vanakkam.